This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in the interior of St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg, Russia. There was a time when this was the central cathedral for the entire Russian Empire. The foundations for this cathedral were first laid by Alexander I after his victory over Napoleon. The foundations were first laid in 1818, and it took 40 years to build this cathedral, and there are more than 300,000 tons of materials used in the construction of this amazing cathedral, including 881 pounds of gold that are used to cover all of its ornamentation and decorations. It is simply amazing. The stonework is fabulous. 20 different kinds of stone from Russia and all over Europe, including 16 tons of malachite and 1,100 pounds of beautiful deep blue lapis. Wow. The interior of this place is simply remarkable. But as beautiful as it is, it pales in comparison to our interiors. Because the Bible tells us we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The word temple is the Greek word naos, and guess what? It's the Greek word for a highly decorated shrine just like this. This room is filled with gold, silver, malachite, lapis. It is simply beautiful beyond description. But within us is also a temple. We are a walking sanctuary. And in fact, what God did in us is so marvelous that in John 1, 12, the Bible says it took the power of God to create the temple that is within us. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. Today I'm beginning a brand new series called You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get a revelation by listening to this week's programs. And today we're going to see that you are God's special project. It's going to be amazing. But I want you to order the whole series. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats. It's called You Are the Temple of of the Holy Spirit. My friend, you need a revelation of who you are. You're not who you used to be. God has turned you into his temple and he lives inside you. What does that mean? You need to know. So order this series called You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit and it comes with a wonderful study guide. And right now I'd like to also suggest that you get my book called A Life Ablaze, 10 Simple Keys to living on fire for God. You're supposed to live on fire for God, not just begin in fire and then lose it. You're to begin on fire, stay on fire, and burn with fire for Jesus to the end of your life. But you need to have the right fuels to inject into your flame so that you keep burning. And that's what this book is about. What kind of fuel you need to be putting into your spiritual life so you stay on fire for Jesus to the end of your life, and you will love this book. So please order yours today. And if you need prayer, please remember that we're here for you, and we would be delighted to pray for you. As soon as your email shows up in our inbox, or when the telephone rings, we take your call, we're going to really begin to put our faith together with you for whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life right now, and we would love to do that with you. But today, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 1. So go ahead and turn there. I hope you have your Bible this week, every day. You are going to need your Bible because we're going to dig very deep into the New Testament. But I want to begin by quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and he says, What? Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That word temple 
is the Greek word neos. That word neos was known to every Greek reader. It described a highly decorated shrine. Just imagine the most elaborate cathedral you have ever walked into and then take it and put it on steroids. Cover it with embellishments, gold, ornamentation, all kinds of marbles and columns and beautiful artwork. That is what the word temple, the Greek word neos, describes. And it is the same word which was used in the Old Testament Septuagint to describe the Holy of Holies inside the temple in Jerusalem. Well, Paul knew all of this. And when he said to the Corinthians and to us, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, he was declaring that God has moved inside us. And what God did in us is elaborate. We are filled with spiritual ornamentation and embellishments, gifts of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, the character of God, the promises of God, the blood of Jesus, all of that is inside us. In fact, what is in us is so marvelous that God said, you know what, I want to live there. And He moved inside us and we are now the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I are walking sanctuaries. That's who we are. But John 1.12 tells us it took real power for this to come about. It says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. It took power to create this in us. And when you come to Ephesians chapter 2, you discover why it took such power. We were a mess before the grace of God touched us. It was going to take miraculous intervention for God to make a temple inside me and inside you. So open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, and today we're going to go right to verse 1. And when you come to this text, the Apostle Paul in verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3 describes what our condition was before God found us, before the grace of God woke us up. And listen to what Paul says beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. But I want you to notice, if you're reading from the King James Version, that the words, hath he quickened, are italicized. That means they were supplied by the translators, and they are not in the Greek text. The Greek text is much more abrupt. It says, in you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul is describing our spiritual state before the grace of God touched us. Wow. We were dead. You know, years ago when I was first being trained for the ministry, the man that I served asked me to conduct my first funeral. So I went ready to conduct my first funeral and something happened that was amazing. It was an unsaved family burying an unsaved family member and they were just swallowed up with grief. Well, when it came time for the family to walk past the casket, the elderly mother walked in front of her son who was laying in the casket, and she was so overwhelmed with grief that before we realized what she had done, she crawled inside the casket. Have you ever seen that happen in a funeral? This was my first funeral. I was officiating, and now I had a mother in the casket on top of her dead son. And she was beating his chest saying, speak to me, speak to me. Then she grabbed him by the shirt and she began to shake him saying, don't leave me like this. Speak to me, speak to me. But it didn't matter how hard she beat his chest or how much she took him by the collar and shook his body. He was not going to speak to her because he was dead. He did not have the ability to respond. His life had expired. It was nothing more than an empty, lifeless corpse. That is precisely the word which Paul now uses in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, to describe us before the grace of God touched us. Paul says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Just like a corpse does not have the ability to respond, we were dead. We were not looking for God. We were not thinking for God. In fact, if God had never pursued us, we would have never found God. This is why Jesus tells us in John 6, unless the Spirit draws someone, they can never come to God. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, all of the lost are sleeping the sleep of death until Christ begins to nudge them and wake them up. As dead people, we simply do not have the ability to find God 
on our own. That is precisely what the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you being dead, dead, the Greek word nekros, it is literally the word for a corpse. Spiritually, we were corpses in trespasses and in sins. Then he goes on to verse 2, and in verse 2, Paul adds, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But notice that the very first of verse 2, he says, Wherein in time past. When you read this in the Greek, I would translate it like this, back then. It's like Paul's putting everything on pause, and he's saying, let's think back to what we were like back then when we were spiritually dead. I say that verse 2 and verse 3 is nearly like Paul reaches into his wallet and pulls out an old photo of what we used to look like before the grace of God touched us. And now he's reminding all of us what we were and what we were like and what we looked like before the grace of God began to wake us up so that we could be saved. And listen to what he says, where and in time past, or you could translate it back then, you walked according to the course of this world. The words according to are a translation of the Greek word kata. The word kata carries the idea of a dominating force, something that is coming down, something that is dominating, something that is subjugating, something that is controlling or even manipulating. It is a powerful force that dominates, subjugates, controls, and even manipulates. And now we find that before the grace of God touched us and we were saved, we walked being dominated, subjugated, controlled, even manipulated by, Paul says, the course of this world. The word course is the Greek word cosmos. The word cosmos describes something that is ordered or something that is arranged. This is why scientists use this word cosmos to describe the universe, because the universe is a place that has order and arrangement. But on a smaller level, this word cosmos described anything with order or arrangement, and it was used in the first century when Paul was writing these verses to describe society, because society has order, it has arrangement. This word could even be used to describe fashion or trends or adornments. That's how this word was used. And Paul says, before the grace of God touched us and we were awakened to an eternal perspective, we and all unsaved people back then, in those days, back then, he's describing what we used to be like, we walked around being dominated, manipulated, and controlled by the world around us. That is what this word course means, the Greek word cosmos. We were impacted by the news. We were impacted by education. We were impacted by what the courts had to say. We were impacted by what Hollywood and theater and entertainment had to say, what fashion had to say, the trends of the day. In fact, he goes on to say, he walked according to the course of this world. The word world really is a poor translation because in Greek it is the word ionos. And the word ionis describes a limited period of time, like a generation, like a decade, or an age. So Paul says unsaved people do not have an eternal perspective. They live simply by the fluctuating standards around them, by the age or the decade, or by the whim of the times that they're living in at the very moment. Of course, this is tragic because the whim of the times can change very easily. Whichever way the wind is blowing, that's the way that society thinks. And now we find that before a person comes to Christ, before they are awakened by the grace of God out of their sleep of death, they simply live dominated, manipulated, and controlled by the world around them, by what fashion says, by what the trend says, by whatever the specific age and the whims of the times have to say, and then Paul goes on to tell us who's really working behind the scenes. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the sons or the children of disobedience. But notice he says, according to, according to, again, is the Greek word kata. And the word kata, again, carries the idea of domination, being dominated, manipulated, controlled by the prince of the power of the air. And here we find that working behind the scenes in the world, 
working behind the scenes in society, there is a sinister force. And Paul calls this sinister force the prince of the power of the air. Notice that here, Paul calls the devil a prince. And in Greek, it has a definite article, which means he is the prince of the power of the air. This word prince describes one that has jurisdiction in a particular realm. The devil has authority in the world system. He does not have authority over the universe. He does not have authority over nature. He works through the world system, which Paul calls the cosmos. He works through people. He works through the courts. He works through entertainment. He works through the whim of the times. That's the jurisdiction through which Satan exercises his authority. And that's what Paul now describes in this verse. So now we find that unsaved people who are spiritually dead, they basically live dominated, manipulated, and controlled by the whim of the times, by the spirit of the age. And working behind the scenes is a sinister force, the prince of the power of the air. And Paul says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The word worketh is a form of the Greek word energeo, and here we find the devil is empowering the world system and creating the whole world to be a place filled with children of disobedience. The word disobedience, the Greek word apatheis, from the word patho, which means to persuade or to convince or to sway, but if you put an A on the front of it, they are no longer persuadable. They are no longer leadable. Rather, they are obstinate, and they are stiff-necked, and they are rebellious. And now we find that Satan's goal is to create a world system filled with people that are obstinate to the law of God and are rebellious to God and refuse to be led by the principles of the Word of God. Then when you come to verse 3, he says, "...among whom we all had our conversation." in times past. This is so very important because there's always someone listening who says, well, I might have been bad, but I was never that bad. So now Paul addresses that person. And he says, hmm, look at it again, among whom also we all had our conversation. In other words, we were all a part of that gang. We may not have realized how lost we were and how spiritually dead we were, but we were all a part of the same gang. That's precisely what he means in verse 3. In fact, he goes on to say, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. The word conversation, the Greek word anastrophe, which describes one's rising up, they're setting down, they're going in, they're going out. It is a picture of their total lifestyle. They're rising up, they're setting down, they're going in, they're going out. Their entire life was dominated by this very short-term perspective, the devil working behind the scenes, people who were basically influenced by the whim of the times and the spirit of the age, not having any idea of eternal things because they are dead in trespasses and sins. My friend, that is the condition of lost people, and that is why it takes a miracle to bring them to Christ. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is willing and ready to perform that miracle for anyone. He will give them ears to hear. He will give them eyes to see. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that is why Jesus said in John 6, that no one can come except the Spirit draws him. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit to wake a sinner out of the sleep of death your salvation, my friend, really is a miracle. It is a miracle. But wait, let's go on. It says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Even as others. Why does he add even as others? Because somebody might say, well, I know that there are some people who were bad, but I don't think I was that bad. Paul says, even as others, we were all a part of the same gang. All of us had sin because of the sin of Adam, which was passed into the human nature. And the Bible says we were by nature the children of wrath. That word nature, the Greek word phusis. Let me give you an example of this word phusis, which here is translated as the word nature. When I was a boy, 
my dad had an aquarium and he loved little fish that were called guppies. And from time to time, we would see guppies be born in our aquarium, little fish. It's amazing, do you know? When those little guppies were born, no one had to give them swimming lessons. They just naturally swam. You know why? Because they were fish. And it is the nature of a fish to swim. You do not have to teach a fish to swim because it is their nature to swim. Now Paul uses this very same idea to describe us. No one had to teach us to be sinners. No one had to teach us to do wrong because we were born in sin. It was our nature to sin. No one has to have sinning lessons because it is their nature to sin before the grace of God touches them and changes them. And the Bible says we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But then God intervened. Listen to verse 5. But God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, I can hardly wait to get back to this verse tomorrow. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he hath loved us. Listen to this in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. And by grace, you are saved. God miraculously touched us. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, 14, that Christ nudged us. He woke us up from our state of spiritual death and quickened us together. He chose us and he gave us life. God did it all. And that is why Paul says, by grace are ye saved. My friend, from the beginning to the end, God did it all. He woke you up. He gave you the faith to believe. He gave you the ability to say yes. And we need to give him a round of applause for what he has done in our life. And that's not all. He put in us a temple. He moved in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are a walking sanctuary. That's quite a change for people who were once spiritually dead. Now we are alive with Christ and God himself dwells in us. Wow. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you and tomorrow we're going to pick up right here. But join me for prayer in just a moment. Do you really know what the Bible means when it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? My friend, you really are the dwelling place for the Spirit of God. And that is amazing and powerful. In this fabulous 10-part series, You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit, Rick Renner unwraps all the intricacies of what the Bible means when it declares that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God put forth His best work when you were born again. And then God placed His greatest treasure deep inside you. In this series, you'll learn you are God's masterpiece. You are a repository of God's greatest treasure you are sealed and guaranteed by God's Spirit. You are filled with the riches of Christ. This life-transforming 10-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, A Life Ablaze. In this book, Rick lays out everything you need to live an intimate, uncompromising life and stay on fire with the Holy Spirit's power for years to come. You can do it, but you need to know how. And that is what you'll discover in this timely book. Order your copy today because it will help you throw the right fuels into your fire to get you burning again. Order your copy of A Life Ablaze today for just $22. Don't miss this special offer. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the book A Life Ablaze. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey, this is Rick Renner, and I'm standing in one of the long corridors in the Tulsa headquarters building. And these corridors are lined with photography of our past ministry. For example, here, it's amazing. You see a picture of me and Denise first starting our ministry as we're traveling in the car with Paul and Philip on her lap, and there's little Joel. But then you look over here, and you see our Russian ministry. Here's Golden Stars with some of the Russian movie stars who came to help us at that event. We had more than 16,000 senior citizens show up. That is amazing. Then you see the youth ministry and us working with members of the government. And here you see again me and Denise 
in our first little church we started in Arkansas many, many, many years ago. And then you look over here and you see us filming TV programs. I mean, there's just so much. And when you walk through these hallways and look at all these pictures, you're just surrounded with what God has done throughout our ministry. And it is amazing. And now, every day in this facility, ministry is taking place. Oh, I wish you could hear the phone calls. And when our team begins to pray, it is like a roar of prayer that you can hear when you walk through our partner care ministry or the letters that are going out or the resources and resources are books and USBs and all kinds of video and audio. And it's going to the ends of the earth. And we're able to do all of that because we have a facility where we can do it. And paying off this facility is our current goal. You know, when we started the ministry expansion project, it was quite large, but we've already paid off half of it. That's amazing. And you helped us to do that. And I want to say thank you. Please help us continue until we finish it. And if you're not a part of the team yet, please pray about becoming a part of our ministry expansion project giving team so we can pay off all of this and then liberate all that money to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's our desire. So I want to say thank you in advance for helping us. This has been good today. And tomorrow, when we come back, we're going to pick up right here. We're going to continue in Ephesians chapter 2 to look at the miraculous work that God did to turn us into the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Thank God for His grace in our lives. And I want you to have the whole series, which is called You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit, and it comes with a study guide. Please order these today. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats. It will feed you and give you a new understanding of who lives in you and what you have become. My friend, you really are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're offering you right now also my book called a Life Ablaze, 10 Simple Keys to Living on Fire for God. But Father, I thank you for the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to wake us out of the sleep of death and to give us life. Lord, I thank you that we are not who we used to be, but Lord, you have changed us by your grace. You've given us the gift of salvation and you have transformed us into the temple of the Holy Spirit and now we are walking sanctuaries. Oh, thank you, Lord. Help us to honor your presence in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Remember that if you need prayer, we're here for you. Just write us or call us. We would love to pray with you. And until tomorrow, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, which says where the word of a king is, there's power. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Rick Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.